Uh, good morning, colleagues, and welcome to the 27th meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, the only business on our agenda today is to take evidence as part of our consideration of the Scottish Government's LCM on the EU withdrawal bill. And we're joined for this item today by Dr Kirsty Hughes, as the Director of the Scottish Centre on European Relations, uh, Professor Alan Page, who is Professor of Public Law at the University of Dundee, Professor Rick Rawlings, who is Professor of Public Law at UCL. I uh, warmly welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning. We've received your very helpful briefings already. I know that all of my colleagues have had a good read at these because we've had a discussion before we kicked off the, the public session. And we're just going to go straight into questions on issues to do with Clause 11. And I think Ash Denham is going to begin that questioning. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, I read with interest some of your submissions that you, you sent through. Obviously, we've been um, carrying out this inquiry for a number of weeks now. I don't know if you were able to catch the last session where we heard from Robin Walker from the UK government and David Mundell. Um, we heard quite a bit during that session about legal certainty. Um, but I noticed, um, Professor Page, in your submission, you said that Clause 11 is not so much about legal certainty as stripping the devolved administrations of the le leverage they would otherwise possess when it comes to the negotiation of common frameworks. And then, Professor Rawlings, you said that removing Clause 11 is needed to give a measure of constitutional security to the devolved governments. Um, and, Professor Page, you said that the effect of Clause 11 has... Um, an effect on the intelligibility of the devolved settlements. So I'm wondering if each of you could explain a little bit further about what you meant by those comments. Yes, um, certainly. Um, can you just remind me of where you started? I, I caught a bit about intelligibility at the end. but Yes, um, it was mainly about Clause 11, 11 not being about legal certainty. Yes, uh, well, I, what, I was, what I was trying to do there was work out the possible justification for uh, Clause 11, and I assume uh, that it is about legal certainty, ensuring that the position after the UK leaves is, is the same as the position before. Um, but uh, I, the point that I then went on to make was um, what that means in practical terms is that the UK or Scotland will be required to comply with retained EU law as opposed to EU law. Uh, and my criticism or my comment is that that ignores the fact that the current obligation, the existing obligation, is rooted in the UK's mem membership of the EU. It's about ensuring that the UK does not fall foul of its obligations as a member state by dint of things done by the devolved administrations. Take the EU out of the equation, um, uh, and that justification ceases to uh, apply, to, to, to have any rationale. It falls away leaving the suspicion um, that um, this is more about, as I said, stripping uh, the devolved administrations of any influence that they might have uh, when it comes to the negotiation of, of common frameworks. And then the points that I went on to make was that quite apart from that, so that, you know, that is a suspicion that is created. Then you have the fear on the part of the devolved administrations that the UK government or Westminster Whitehall departments will prefer to hang on to uh, repatriated competences rather than pass them on to the devolved administrations. Quite apart from which, and this was the point that I, I concluded with, that um, proceeding in that way uh, will have substantial effects in terms of both the intelligibility of the settlement, because we're substituting an obligation to comply with EU law, which people for the most part, readily understand that uh, we've been doing it ever since the devolution was in place. Uh, there is a common understanding as to what that involves, with this much less, with this much more amorphous and uncertain concept, retained EU law. Uh, and I quoted, I think, the, the late Professor Sir Neil McCormick on the 1978 Act, who said that intelligibility was a quality greatly to be prized in constitutional statutes. The 78 Act certainly did not. Uh, meet that test, and I think that will be the case too uh, with the um, Scotland Act as, a, as it is intended to be uh, amended by, by Clause 11. And then the operability point means that, uh, by that I was simply referring to the fact that this is, this is going to make it much more difficult 
uh, for the devolved administrations to pursue any sort of meaningful policy in areas which, such as agriculture, which are devolved under the current settlement. Thank you. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, you, my, my angle of approach would be as follows, that yes, you need um, elements of certainty. Yes, you need elements of stability uh, for the purposes um, uh, of business, um, for the purposes of uh, consumers and trade negotiations as well. The question is whether you need Clause 11 um, to achieve that. And my view, my firm view, is that Clause 11 is a poor choice of approach uh, to secure that. And um, in my paper, I developed that argument and um, put forward several reasons why I think that is so. In my view, Clause 11 is unnecessarily heavy. Um, as this committee moves inexorably to say that it cannot recommend legislative consent for this bill as it is currently um, formulated, uh, I think that will show that point, and you will find a parallel process going on in the National Assembly for Wales. Um, of that, I'm sure. Um, clause 11 seems to me to be an unbalanced clause, especially when you set it... I mean, we focus on clause 11, don't we? But I think we also have to read clause 11 first with clause 10, but then also with the powers that um, the UK government uh, will be taking on under clauses 7, 8 and 9. And once you read clause 11 in that context, uh, I think you see quite how unbalanced it is. And I would also suggest that uh, Clause 11 ultimately is counterproductive. Um, what we need here is, without being naive about political difference and the scope for political controversy and dispute, we need a modicum of trust and cooperation between the different governments and the different parliaments in the United Kingdom. And to me, Clause 11 is essentially a banner which says, we don't trust you. And I don't think that that's an appropriate place in which to start. Um, well, just, just to good morning, everybody, and thank you for, for inviting me. Um, just, just to add briefly, I think I, th I think what was done in the withdrawal bill in terms of devolved competences, and particularly in clause clause eleven, was was as, as one of my colleagues has just said, extremely. Crude. It was. It was almost like a, a knee-jerk reading of the fact that well, there were these powers at EU level. The UK government represented uh, the UK at EU level, so that's kind of straightforward. Just to just to bring it all back to London and and, and not care about the the de devolved and constitutional implications. I think it's. Uh, it, it would in any event be an extraordinarily difficult constitutional challenge to find an appropriate solution to this, especially under time constraints. But I th for me, it's extremely important to, to keep reminding ourselves of the wider context, that, that the political and economic wider context is, is verging on the chaotic and the profoundly damaging. And so, so we're not just talking about constitutional changes and an appropriate devolution um, settlement in a static context. We're talking about an extraordinary upheaval, um, which I, I think whatever sort of Brexit we're facing is going to be damaging for Scotland, whether Scotland is in the UK or whether Scotland um, is independent. So I just think that, that broader context, um, and otherwise I, I broadly agree with what my colleagues have said. Thank you. So without getting into what alternatives to Clause 11 there might be, because I know some of my colleagues will want to ask you questions uh, about those possibilities, if Clause 11 was to go ahead as it's currently drafted, could you just explain for us a little bit about what difficulties that would throw up, particularly possibly for parliamentary scrutiny or for government with, with these limitations that would be put onto the devolved governments? Yeah, yes, certainly. I think uh, I've already alluded to them. Um, essentially, what it will do is to make the, the business of working out what is within the, the legislative competence of this parliament and also the executive competence of, of Scottish ministers a much more difficult task than it has been hitherto. Um, as I said, uh, there's a relatively straightforward understanding about what the restrictions are 
uh, involved in the obligation to act compatibly with EU law involve, uh, that will become a much more uncertain, difficult process when we're talking about um, retained EU law, which is a much more complex, difficult uh, concept to grapple with and to understand. And I think, going back to what I was saying about um, oh, the quotation I gave you from Professor Sir Neil McCormick, in technical terms, what you're doing is grafting a conferred powers model onto a reserve powers model. Uh, the reserve powers model, as you know, means that uh, if it's not reserved, you can do it with a conferred powers model. On the other hand, you have to be looking to see what exactly it is you can do. We're talking about it. And this is where I think the whole thing is fundamentally misconceived. You know, we're talking about going through 111 powers and working out which are reserved, which are devolved. And let's assume for the argument, for the sake of argument, that we reach a deal in which some, we decide that should, some should be reserved, but they will be subject to exceptions and so on. And it's at that point, you think this is just, this is not the right way to go about it. And if I, if I could just follow up on the, the last point that Professor Mo Rawlings made about this, this being an unhelpful start, the way I would summarise it is to say that the, the premise on which the, the bill is based is, or the clause, clauses 10 and 11 are based, is of the devolved nations as a problem to be dealt with um, rather than as part of the solution. Delinquent children who, given half a chance, uh, will seize the opportunity to make mischief and ought therefore to be prevented from doing so. I think that's where the legislation starts and where the difficulties arise. I think, I, I mean, I'd, I'd divide my answer there, I think, into two sections. First, the, 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 the legal perspective, um, following up on what Professor Page was saying, there is a difficulty, clearly, with this whole concept of what we mean by retained EU law. And um, I think the big, a big point to make there is that retained EU law, although at first sight it may look as if it's a frozen concept, that we take a picture of it and there it is, if one looks carefully at the provisions of the bill, there is provision for um, uh, Whitehall and Westminster actually to change what we mean by retained EU law. So it's a moving target. And um, certainly in Wales, and I, I, I would imagine in Scotland, I'm, you know, I do my work in Wales, um, there is great concern um, in the Assembly about this because this uh, clearly relates to competence. And this uh, immediately, the government lawyers will then have to work out, well, is such and such within competence or is it not, when retained EU law may actually be shifting. Um, of course, it calls into question the role of the presiding officer, because the presiding officer will have to make rulings as to whether proposed measures are or are not within competence. And um, then, of course, we are dealing here with common frameworks in, um, a reg in regulatory fields. Many of these common frameworks will uh, be operating in commercial fields. And um, as a lawyer, um, I'm well aware that where there is money, as there tends to be in the commercial field, there is litigation. Um, so it seems to me this is a, a, a particular issue for the devolved administrations, right, which of course doesn't play the same way in Westminster because of parliamentary sovereignty. Right? They don't have those issues of competence, which in the devolved administrations and in, in, in the devolved assemblies and parliaments, we all have to experience. Um, the other point that, that, that I would make about the release and what, what um, Alan has said about reserved and conferred powers, um, I think colleagues will appreciate that um, there is a particular feeling about this in Wales, given that we have just achieved with the Wales Act a move from a conferred powers model to a reserved powers model. So now to be confronted with the idea that having got to a reserved powers model, following in the footsteps of the Scottish Parliament, to be confronted with um, an aggregate which includes a conferred powers model um, has a particular um, uh, context, shall we say, in Wales. The other point that I wanted to make, um, it, 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 in a sense I've already touched on it, I don't think that this is just a matter of law. Um, I think it's a sense of, of trust and collaboration and um, going forward in partnership. 
right? And yes, we can talk about issues of legislative consent, but I think it, it, it goes more broadly than that. As, uh, let me put it this way, colleagues. It's very striking to me, as an outsider, that the very first question that this committee has got into is Clause 11. Right, and it's wholly understandable that you have, and I, you know, but it's warping the conversation, right? In a, we ought to be talking, it seems to me, about the substance. We ought to be talking about what these common frameworks, whatever they are, are actually going to look like and are actually going, what they're going to consist of. But we rightly, understandably, keep getting dragged back to Clause 11, right? And I think that's telling you a lot about why Clause. 11 is a poor choice of model. We'll obviously get into common frameworks shortly, but Dr Hughes, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, a, a couple of points. Um, firstly, uh, it's obviously quite, quite complicated what's going on in the sense of you're taking away the EU level, so you're collapsing it down to the UK, however you're doing that within or without the, the devolved structures. If you think in the, in, in the way UK membership of, of the European Union has, has worked in terms of implementing directives, directives obviously have to, have to, have to meet, you know, Im implement what has been agreed in Brussels, but there is also some flexibility in that in the past has, has led the UK to often be accused of gold plating its directives so, so that when the Sun or others might complain about Brussels interference, you'd be told actually, you know, you, you always go too far. You didn't have to do those extra bits. Those aren't all, even though it comes from an EU directive, um, that, that doesn't all come from Brussels. Um, now, of course, that, that when, when EU laws came to Holyrood, then that, that option of exactly how to do it was, was here. And it's, it's, it's maybe a relatively small point in all these, these wider points. But, you know, how, how is that going to, to work? Even if something is agreed at Westminster, you're get, then going to lose that ability, probably, to, to, to tweak it here. So, so I think that's, that's one issue. I think, um, I think I, on the substantive issues that, that Rick was talking about, um, I, I would put it slightly differently, I think, in, in the context of the withdrawal bill. There's, there's a huge chicken and egg problem here overall in, in the withdrawal bill, because the intention is, is said to be to, to bring EU, EU law into UK law as retained law, but as, as a number of committee inquiries, the House of Lords in various guises has done reports of this, have, have said, without knowing the regulatory structures, the agencies and, and so forth, a, a lot of that law, for instance, um, in the environmental area, won't work or it won't work in, in the same area. So Westminster, as, as, as well as Holyrood and, and the Welsh Assembly, are being asked to take these decisions without knowing about the regulatory agencies. And Michael Gove talked a few days ago about a UK environmental agency. So, so, so there's a kind of incoherence and inconsistency going on here, which, which is not only about devolution, but it certainly is about devolved powers. Um, and it, it's, it's part of the problem of trying to re-engineer your whole whole regulatory and policy system um, that is so deeply embedded, as, as you know, Pascal Lamy call, called it trying to unscramble an omelette. So I, I, I think that's, that's extremely problematic. And, and just one, one other thing to, to drop in here, though it's per perhaps a more general point. The EU27 are watching closely what's happening with the withdrawal bill. They are very concerned about level playing fields. They are also aware of the fact that bringing retained law in, into the UK without sorting out these regulatory questions and issues that are profound and detailed and, and will take a long time is, is very worrying for them too. Uh, Willie Coffey, I think you wanted to go into alternatives to Clause 11. Yeah, yeah thanks, Convener. I just wonder if we could stick with Clause 11 just for a wee while. Professor Rawlings, and, and look at some of the alternatives that you, you've both uh, offered. Uh, Professor Rawlings, you said that the sooner Clause 11 is cast aside, the better. Uh, and you're going to say that it's akin to Greater England Unionism. <laughs> it's a lovely phrase. Uh, uh, Professor Page, you were talking about standstill provisions uh, while the frameworks have been worked out. I wonder if you could both offer the committee your views on what alternatives may actually look like so that we could compare and contrast those, please. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, I think I said at the beginning of my submission that 
reading the bill, you had the sense of you know, a piece of legislation which had been drafted without a proper understanding of devolution law, or certainly with scant regard to the principles on which um, the devolution settlements are based. Um, and what I had in mind in relation to Clause 11 uh, was the fact that if you look at the Scotland Act and if you look at Schedule 5 and the list of reserve powers, then they do a lot of the job that Clause 11 is supposed to be doing in the sense of they reserve things to the UK government or to, to the West, Westminster Parliament, the rationale for which is that these are about the UK single market. So that concept is built into and secured by, by the devolution settlement. And Clause 11, therefore, it seems to me, has been drafted without a proper appreciation of the part that is already played by the existing settlement in securing the integrity of, of the UK single market. I'm referring here to Schedule 5, but also there are powers, powers of intervention, veto powers conferred on UK ministers in relation to both legislation passed by this Parliament, Section 35, and the uh, executive action, including the making of subordinate legislation by the Scottish ministers on, under Section 58, which means that if these powers were to belong or to be repatriated to Edinburgh um, rather than to London, uh, there is very little effective scope uh, for um, the making of mischief which was how I referred to it earlier. So I, I think that um, that dimension has been completely ignored in, in the drafting of the legislation. Allied to which I asked myself the question, well, what is it that you, you are trying to prevent here? Or, or what is the concern? Uh, and the concern is, and I said this in the paper that I did for the uh, Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee last year, last August, shortly after the referendum, the fear is that the four governments within the United Kingdom will ride off in, uh, in separate directions. Uh, and in so doing, compromise the integrity of the single market. That acknowledges that we already have a single market, in contrast to the EU, which is still trying to create one. Uh, and therefore, it seemed to be that all we needed was to say, right, we're not going to do that. We'll have a standstill agreement whereby we will all agree not to introduce anything or do anything, uh, which could involve the, and I'm now quoting the Prime Minister, I think, reasonably accurately. We will not, the guiding principle that they talked about in the white paper, we will not introduce anything. Uh, in, we will not introduce new barriers to doing business or living uh, within our union. Why don't we just simply agree to do that? And that would then pave the way for the discussions which need to take place and um, the need is accepted uh, as to where we're going to have common frameworks, you know, what these are going to look like, you know, what form they're going to take, how are they going to be revised, and so on. So I, I think you could solve the problem without Clause 11 and all its, and, you know, I'm completely persuaded of the disadvantageous consequences of Clause 11, which we've already talked about, without having these disadvantageous consequences. So I would simply take as my starting point the existing settlement, acknowledge that it uh, contains within it uh, inbuilt protections of the UK single market. It goes a long way in the direction you need. Uh, and if you have any concerns over and above that, then you simply agree among yourselves, no, we're not going to do anything that would threaten its integrity, and we'll get on with this business of working out uh, what common fr frameworks we will actually need as a result of EU withdrawal. Job done. Yeah. Actually, just, could you just say a wee bit more about Clause 58 in particular and how that m m might interrelate with potential trade deals in the future as well? Because uh, th there is a, a mechanism there that the U which is available which effectively constrains, yeah. if I've got that right. J for the record purposes, I think it would be useful to just to hear from you a bit more about that sp specific bit. Yeah. I think what Clause, clause 58, if, if, I recall, if I recall it accurately, uh, um, what it says basically is that if the Secretary of State is of the view is, or is persuaded action being taken by uh, the Scottish ministers would, um, I forget how exactly it's put, but you know, would compromise or affect uh, 
compliance with the UK's international obligations, then uh, the Secretary of State may either uh, prevent that action from being taken, may prevent that action from being taken. Conversely, where action is required, the Secretary of State may require that action to be taken. And where the action has taken the form of subordinate legislation, then the Secretary of State can nullify it. And I, I'm astonished. I'm, ast I'm astonished there's been no reference to Section 58 in any of us. I'm sure we're getting this on the record because it's quite an important power. Could you just clar clarify, Professor Page, that your, your view is that, that, as far as you know, that, that power has never been used, and indeed it's never been used in relation to any of the devolution settlements? I think that is correct, yes. It's never been used in Wales? I'm, I'm not, not aware of the position in Wales, but uh, certainly it hasn't been used in Scotland, and yeah. I think if it had been used in Wales, I would, I would have picked that up. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, the fact that it hasn't been used so d should not... Uh, divert us from you know, its significance or the potential, the knowledge that that power is there. No, I, think I'd, I think I'd want to make two points there. I mean, first, obviously, the question from the convener was, was targeted on Section 58, so we ought to, to um, sort of have it on the record that there, there are parallel provisions across all the devolution settlements. So it covers Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, though interestingly the committee may want to note the different wordings in the... Um, uh, in the devolution um, statutes on that. I believe the Scottish one is if the Secretary of State has reasonable grounds, whereas in the Welsh one, I believe it says if the Secretary of State considers. I haven't got the, 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 the statutes in front of me, but I believe there's a, an interesting difference um, that, 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 that the committee may want to note. Um, and then the second point is um, my understanding is that those powers haven't been used. Um, but of course, if we contextualise that a little bit, um, that is about preventing the breach of international obligations. And, of course, as long as we've been inside the EU, that has had a more limited ambit. Once we're outside the EU, then um, one sees immediately that, that could, those could become very significant powers. And I echo what, what Professor Page has said. Um, it seems to me that that's a crucial aspect which needs to be factored into this whole debate. So, so well, the apologies, Willie. I want to just tease this a bit further because that section, that power might exist. But if I understand it correctly, under 58.3, the the 58.3, yeah, effectively, yeah. the UK government could instruct the Scottish government to introduce legislation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but the problem is, what happens if the Parliament doesn't pass it? <laughs> I think I've made that point of my book. Yes, you can instruct the. Uh, the government to introduce legislation, but that is not a guarantee that it will pass it. But we're not going to get in, into that territory at all. The, the other point that I would make, just listening to Professor Rawlings, is talking about the difference between the Welsh and the Scottish settlements or the, or, 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 or the provisions that, yes, it is if the Secretary of State has reasonable grounds to believe, and it has to be a reason justification which opens up the possibility of judicial review. So it can't be just a sort of the Secretary of State decides and gives an instruction. Uh, it has to be reasoned. Okay, sorry, sorry. Well, Kirsty, if you say something, I'll come back to you. Well, I just want to make sure we had that on the record, folks. So. Well, Kirsty, uh, yes, <coughs> just a, a couple of comments, and I wanted to slightly disagree with what with what Alan has said um, in terms of of the single the UK single market. I mean, I, I agree with him that, that the concerns were around that in creating creating an integrity of a single market around the, the, the four four countries and, and areas of, of the UK. Um, and he said that the EU single market is still developing, which is clearly true. It's not complete, for instance, in services. It's trying to go further in, in digital. But I think the large part of the UK single market is simply a part of the European Union single market. It doesn't exist separately from that in terms of the, the laws and the regulatory structures, the international trade deals and so forth. And that is part of the complexity of Brexit. And so that if you go, and, and a further point on top of that, if, if you went for a general statement like saying we won't introduce new barriers, I think that could certainly cuts across the Scottish government's policy that has also been supported in, in this parliament um, of arguing for, for Scotland to stay in the EU single market and in the UK, because that certainly would introduce at least some barriers, even though I'm aware that the First Minister has, has said it would, would create um, 
it could it could still continue in, in that model to have frictionless trade through between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Okay, that's opening up a wider set of issues, but they, they, I think these are all these are all relevant here. I, I think we'll come on to some of some more of the trade issues later. Right, sorry, I hope I've not cut across any of your questions. No, no, not at all. Thanks, thanks, Bruce. Uh, just back to the the standstill uh, agreement that you spoke about, Professor Page. It, it really is about trust, that isn't it? And Professor Rollins, you were talking about it's basically we don't trust you, so this provision is there. Uh, could that standstill agreement basically stand alone without any legislative framework over the top of that? I mean, if it's about trust and everybody trusts one another and acts reasonably, then it can stand alone. But does it need to itself be backed up by anything? Legislative over the top of it. The visitorship being written into the EU withdrawal bill, I thought it would take the form of a concordat, uh, an understanding between um, the four administrations. We've got lots of experience of these. I think they always say this is not intended to create legal obligations. Uh, so we're not talking about a legal obligation, but we are talking about an understanding which I would expect to be adhered to. And if it wasn't, as I say, there is the option of. Um, you know, intervention in the event uh, that uh, the Secretary of State has grounds to believe that action to be taken by. I think the point to bear in mind here is that you can't introduce new <coughs> barriers by the back door, as it well, or, or surreptitiously. You are talking about legislation, either an act of the Scottish Parliament or, or subordinate legislation. So I, I think the risk uh, of that happening is, is very, very slight indeed. And Professor Rollins, you, your alternative suggestion was about, I think, about adding or changing reservations in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland acts to reflect the agreed frameworks that you could train them themselves in statute. Could you just expand a wee bit on that? Surely. I mean, in, 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 in a sense, it goes back to my, my, my sort of original set of comments that, that, that let's try and move beyond Clause 11, as it were, or park, put Clause 11 over there for a bit. And, and I mean, my, my big message to the committee would be, well, let's get on with it then. Right, and that, that is not, a, I hasten to say, directed at the committee, it's directed at the governments, right? And I want to say that, that I'm, you know, very pleased um, with developments over the last month or so, right? I mean, it is great to see the, the finally, the JMC European negotiations meeting and um, agreeing a set of principles on how common framework, you know, what common frameworks might look like, and um, how they might be constructed, and, and and that is a great thing, right? And I'm I'm really pleased with that. And again, I mean, you know, I would be very much in favour of um, very pleased to see the Prime Minister, um, first of all, speaking to the Welsh First Minister, and then yesterday the Scottish First Minister, precisely about these issues. And this is exactly to me what should be happening. Um, that said, right, I'd, I'd also want to place on the record that, you know, much valuable time has been lost. Um, we are now at a stage where I think we have the list of 111 um, areas of intersection um, between the Scottish devolution settlement and um, incoming EU competences, as it were. Um, we have a list of 64 in Wales. And we have another list in Northern Ireland, though that's not yet been published, I think. Um, now, I'll be frank, um, that has taken, what are we, something like 15 months, 17 months, I lose track of how far we are on from the EU referendum. Um, to be generous, that should have taken 17 weeks, right? We are a year behind where we should be, frankly. Um, you know, it just doesn't take that long to do the technical job of working out where the, the areas of intersection are. But we are where we are, and, and clearly there is movement, and that's good. So we do that. We have to sit down, and <coughs> negotiations have to happen. Um, and um, I'm sure that Secretary of State um, Mandel has got this right when he says, first thing we do is we look at the lists. What are the ones where we all agree they've got to be common frameworks? What are the ones where we all agree we really don't need common frameworks? And then, of course, there'll be the ones in the middle where we have a serious discussion, right? That's the next stage, right? And it seems to me that as we go through that process, right, the natural thing to do is where we've got... Um, we, can get, we can get rid of Clause 11 and we can say, right, where we identify where we need common frameworks, we can be talking about reservations, <coughs> 
in the devolution statutes. And that gets around the kind of problem that Alan was right, quite rightly flagging up, right, about how you join up a conferred model and a, and, a, and a reserve powers model. That seems to me to go with the grain of the devolution statutes, right? So the big message here is get on with it. Now, parliamentary sovereignty. To me, coming back to Clause 11, the exercise of parliamentary sovereignty in the bill is the wrong way round. It's being used up front. That's not how you need to go about this, it seems to me. Parliamentary sovereignty, I would argue to the UK government and have, should in a sense here be the reserve power. That we have the discussions, as David Mundell has, has said, we do not have frameworks by imposition, we have frameworks by agreement. There may ultimately come a time, and naturally I've been pressed on this when I've given evidence in Westminster, right? There could conceivably be a case where the administrations just cannot agree. And the UK believes that the UK government believes there is a fundamental union interest in play. At that point, it is conceivable that parliamentary sovereignty might have to be exercised and we would be into civil convention territory. Personally, I don't think that's going to happen for the kind of reasons of mutual interest of the different countries of the United Kingdom. But if it did happen, one can conceive of parliamentary sovereignty as a reserve power in that situation at the end of the day to resolve matters. So that's where I am. But, but I, you know, I, 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 I just want to park Clause 11, and I want to go through the process of the work, right? And, you know, maybe I'm an optimist in life. But I actually think that a lot of this can be sorted out. When one looks at the list, right, I think that there would be widespread agreement around this committee room, right, that some things really don't need common frameworks, some do, and then, of course, there'll be a natural debate about, you know, some in the middle. <coughs> Okay, thank you very okay. much. Okay. Uh, Mardo, I think you had some follow-up questions. Yes, uh, thank you. I mean, <coughs> Professor Rawlings, I think that's been a very helpful uh, exposition of, of your position in relation to common frameworks being the alternative that's required to Clause 11. I know other members want to come in later and look at the detail of common frameworks, but I just want to address the principle. So perhaps I could ask um, the other two witnesses if they would agree with you in terms of your general approach that the, the, the alternative to Clause 11 is to have common frameworks and, perhaps more importantly, a mechanism for agreeing those common frameworks. Professor Page, maybe. Well, yes, I would, I would agree. I, I agree with what Professor Rawlings said about the need to get on with it. I would add to that, get on with it and don't make a meal of it. Um, 111 intersecting powers, the temptation must be you know, we'll go through this, and this is this is an invitation to rewrite the devolution settlement. Should this be reserved? Should this be devolved? <laughs> I mean, I think that you know would be an enormous diversification and waste of, waste of effort. It shouldn't be a difficult business to work out where these common frameworks are needed. Just do it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. I, th I think common frameworks can re resolve some of this. I think. As you say, the, the mechanisms for agreeing them is, is certainly not straightforward, as I think the preceding discussion has illustrated. Um, and I also think, and this is what I put in, in my written evidence, um, that if we were going down what's been called a soft Brexit route, I always put that in inverted commas because I don't think there is any soft Brexit in all the impacts, as I said before, are, are negative. Um, if we were in the European economic area and in the EU's customs union, um, not a combination that, that's happened before, you would still have common frameworks at European level. It would just be at EEA level, no longer at, at EU level. So I think... Given that the UK government has made it clear we're not going for a, a Norway model, um, and so it's heading for some sort of free free trade deal, it says it doesn't want a Canada-style one, but I think that's what the EU27 uh, is clearly going to offer if, if the UK rejects the Norway one. Um, common frameworks work in the context of, of a hard Brexit, but if you want a soft Brexit, then I, then I think this discussion is at that point going, going right down a, a rather different 
a different route. So, so the idea that you solve these things in a way that are completely neutral to the f to the form of Brexit, uh, once you're talking about common common frameworks, I think is clearly wrong. Okay. Do you want to? Can I ask a supplementary on? Um, thank you, Kavina, on um, the back of what Professor Rawlings has said, and this is a, this is a lawyer's question to lawyers, really. Um, given what you've said about um, the importance of common frameworks and the importance of holding parliamentary sovereignty in reserve. Um, do you imagine that the common frameworks themselves will be statutory? Do you imagine that the common frameworks themselves will need to be recognised in statute? Um, and, and is it your evidence to the committee that once the common frameworks have been agreed, that in at least some, in respect to at least some of those common frameworks, there will need to be fresh reservations added to Schedule 5 to the Scotland Act and um, uh, like reservations added to the relevant schedules of the Wales and Northern Ireland Acts. So I just want to be absolutely clear about where, where you are in terms of the relationship between the common frameworks and statute law. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we need to work out where they're needed and what they will consist of. And then, as you rightly point out, whether or not they, they need to be on a statutory basis. And if they are to be on a statutory basis, is that going to be a sort of pan-UK statutory basis, or is it going to be on a mixed basis involving legislation by this parliament and the other devolved legislatures uh, and, and um, the UK parliament? And also, very, very importantly, I would have said, you know, what mechanisms will there be for changing those frameworks? How are they going to be managed? How are they, how are they going to be amended? As to whether or not uh, they should appear by way of amendment or be reflected in amendments to, in Scotland's case, Schedule 5, uh, one of the points that I've been keen to stress throughout um, this whole process is that we're talking not just about an EU withdrawal bill, but a Brexit legislative programme. Uh, which will involve other bills, one of which has already been published, and we will see others which are of direct concern and relevance to this Parliament, notably one on agriculture. Uh, and rather than putting all our eggs in the EU withdrawal bill basket, you know, we ought to look at the thing in the round and acknowledge, I would expect, that when you are actually talking about agriculture, we will have a, a much clearer understanding of where we need common frameworks. And that may well involve um, amendments to Schedule 5, and I would expect these to be done on the basis of agreement. So I would take a more, on the one hand, I'm saying get on with it, but on the other hand, I'm saying don't lose sight of the bigger framework, which, uh, and some of this, not all of it, I don't want to say statute is, the whole thing needs to be statutory. Some of it may well be statutory and will ultimately be reflected in Scotland's case in, in amendments to Schedule 5. That's helpful. Thank you. Professor Rawlings, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. And um, if, I, if, I, if I may go back to, to um, your meeting last week, when I obviously I was reading the evidence uh, ahead of today's session, and I don't want to engage in semantics, but, but one thing I found myself disagreeing with the Secretary of State about was the way in which he, he, he classified um, different approaches. He talked about areas where you would not need frameworks. Then he talked about areas where you would need frameworks. And then he talked about areas where you might have concordats or memorandums of understanding. And I, I rather, I, my approach is, is somewhat different to that because I would, I would see the idea of frameworks as, yes, sometimes involving reservations, sometimes involving statute law, but also frameworks can be softer than that. Right. So, in other words, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start off by distinguishing frameworks from ideas of memorandums of understanding and concordats. And, in fact, from my work, when I've done a lot of work over the years on EU governance and EU administration, what one finds when one looks at those sectors of the single market is that you have creative mixes of what lawyers like to call hard formal law and soft concordat-type law. Yeah. And soft, though. <laughs> I, 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 no, I, I, I can imagine, but I. So I don't. But coming back to your question, I, I, I don't think it's kind of you know either or. Uh, 
right. I think there's, I think there's quite a scope here for, 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 for creative mixes. Thank you. Thanks. Kirsty, before we move on, do you want to add anything to that? No, I'm fine, thank okay. you. Um, Alexander, I think, but I hope not tread too much in the area you were going to go into. No, uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, professors, Doctor, good, good morning. If we could uh, continue on the common frameworks. Um, just very briefly, you know, we have heard in, in previous evidence uh, um, you know, views as to the number of frameworks or the areas of frameworks, uh, whether it's you know, agriculture, energy, environment. Uh, just for completion's sake, could I get your very, very briefly your your views on that? Uh, but then, could we move on to really what I hope you've been wanting to talk about, nicely teed up, which is the substance of common frameworks? Uh, and can I really ask you to, to move on to that, okay. and Professor Rawlings? Uh, would you like to start, maybe, since you? Well, I think I think it might be helpful to to, to the committee. I, I I don't know if the committee's done this. Is actually to compare the Scottish and the Welsh lists. Right. I think I think that's actually quite an instructive thing to do, um, because immediately what you find when you do that is that if you're taking a Welsh perspective, we're in the multilateral game. Why do I say that? Because every single item on the Welsh list is in the Scottish list. But of course, because the um, there are more powers in, devolved in Scotland than there are in Wales. That's where you get the extras, right? And then I think it's worth again placing on record where are those extras? Those extras tend to be in two big areas. Um, and again, you'd anticipate them, but I, but I think it's, it's, it's worth emphasising. The first is around justice, right? Um, because, of course, in, in Wales we share... Um, a legal system with England and Wales. So, in a sense, we, you know, we have our common framework with England expressed already through a set of common frameworks expressed through the England and Wales justice system, right? Um, so, there's a lot there that we don't have in Wales that, that that you have in Scotland. So, immediately, that that opens up the prospect there of bilateral discussions between the Scottish government and the UK government that the Welsh wouldn't sort of be directly engaged in. Um, and the second area where you see difference, and it's related, of course, is around there are a number, um, I noticed, uh, around data sharing, um, data protection. Um, there, are, there are significant lists there. And again, those don't bite in Wales. Right. So I, 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 I say that to clear because I, that I, I think that helps to contextualise immediately the, the, what we're talking about here with common frameworks. What are bilateral common frameworks, perhaps? What are multilateral common frameworks? And of course, when the, the list for Northern Ireland is eventually published, that again, I think, will be worth studying because that may then um, open up the issue about are we talking about UK common frameworks are we talking about GB common frameworks? Because we know that some of the, um, the economic sectors, for example, with energy in Northern Ireland, are um, heavily integrated um, with the Republic. Right? So I think that's a, a really important starting place, if, that, if that's helpful. Indeed. Thank you very much. Dr Hughes? Well, I think just, just following on from, from those last remarks um, it's you know it's clear that it unless and until we know the, the sort of deal if we're going to have a deal with the EU 27 um, how do you design the common frameworks we, we've had in the last week or so um, the argument um, that Ireland should remain sorry Northern Ireland should remain in both the customs union and the single market um, that will put it in a very different position in terms of, of frameworks than, than the rest of the UK at that point. Um, that's also going to cut across all the most obvious areas, whether it's agriculture or, in, or environment and, and so forth. So, uh, to, to refer to Michael Gove again and his suggestion there's going to be a UK environment agency. So that's already, in a sense, taking a decision or or at least indicating the direction of travel for, for, for a decision, um, not only in t with respect to the devolved nations, but also with respect to, to how any future EU27 UK deal, deal may work. Um, I think there's also, there's also obviously a timing 
question here. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm as optimistic as Alan about how, how easily you, you, can, you can resolve this and establish the common frameworks. But if we're going to have, say, a two-year transition, um, so we leave the EU at the end of March uh, 2019, but we have a two-year transition, then the EU 27 are, are also being very clear that that transition should be, in some sense, a prolongation of the EU's acquis. Now, exactly how that happens is not clear to me. Um, you can, do you get temporary membership of the European Economic Area plus some other prolongation of the EU's customs union? That has never you know, happened. And, and we know, of course, that Turkey's customs union is only one for industrial goods. But so at what point does the withdrawal bill and the UK Common Frameworks anyway starts. And also, of course, during that transition, you are still attempting to negotiate the final trade deal, even though if there is a deal next autumn, you will at least have an outline and a political declaration of what the desired future EU27 um, UK, UK setup is. Um, and you also then have, have a, a potential problem. What if you get to the end of that two-year transition? It can't be prolonged. Um, do you have an inter intermediate period where you have a certain sort of set of UK common frameworks, but they change again another two or three years later when you finally do agree your Canada-style uh, trade deal or whatever else it is? So I think all, all these levels are, are to some extent, to some extent, interdependent. Um, and it's, it seems that this discussion is being had very much about UK, Scotland, UK devolved nations, and, and maybe in. Given all the complexities, that's that's one way to have a first first go at it. But it it does it pre sort of presumes we know what's happening at the level above or what is going to happen. Professor Page. Uh, yes, <coughs> thank you. Just to add a couple of points, um, Professor Rawlings invited us to compare the, compare the two lists, and that was an exercise that he and I uh, found ourselves engaged in the previous. Uh, another committee hearing. One of the things that I found instructive about the comparing the Scottish and Welsh list, which is probably worth bearing in mind um, when the committee comes to think about this further, is that the Welsh list is set out much more helpfully than the Scottish list. Um, and by that I mean that uh, it's set out by departments. It is, if you like, a shopping list set out by Whitehall Department, whereas the Scottish list is just, you know, I think it's possibly even in alphabetical order. It's just 111 powers with no indication of where they come from or who's, who's highlighted them or flagged them uh, as areas uh, of devolved competence which intersect uh, with, with EU responsibilities. And the reason I mention that is because if you look at Schedule 5 of the, of the Scotland Act, then, OK, the names have changed, the nomenclature has changed over the years, but the section A, B, C, it's... It is the shopping list of individual Whitehall departments, the things that they thought uh, should be reserved, and so it maps onto that. Um, uh, and so I, I think that's an instructive way of... There's an issue about, and I, and I experienced this when I you know, wrote that paper for the um, Europe and External Relations Committee, at what level of generality do you pitch this in such a way as to make it meaningful? And I tried to pitch it in a way which I thought was meaningful. Uh, and the great danger is that you end up descending into such a level of detail, it ceases to be meaningful or it becomes so technical that you say, oh, we'll just have to leave this to lawyers and we can't exercise any meaningful degree of control over it. But in terms of substance, and just going through my list, the ones that I picked out, and I, I just give you them in no particular order, are financial assistance to industry, uh, state aids, um, and then I, I had picked out a whole series of powers to control the movement of food, animals, animal products, plants, plant products, animal feeding stuff, fertilizers and pesticides. These are all mentioned in Schedule 5. Product standards, public procurement, animal health and welfare, food safety, food labeling, uh, food composition, fishing uh, and the environment. So um, I think there's... Sounds like a long list, but it's a lot shorter than 111. Uh, and, uh, and that's where I would expect the, the principal focus to be. Uh, thank you. I just want, uh, yeah, it's very helpful. And you know, it's the first time we've been hearing about the Welsh list and the Scottish list being compared to each other. Um, and 
you know, hearing of your wish to get on with it, have you actually done any work even beyond that <coughs> of actually seeing what a draft framework in one of these areas would actually look like? Just very briefly. We, we, <laughs> we haven't okay. had that pleasure yet. Right, so um, I, if I make two points, I make two points about that. Um, first, I, 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 um, you will have seen that in the evidence I, I presented to the committee, what I've tried to do is, in a sense, the next step beyond the JMC communique. The JMC communique has some sort of very valuable high order principles. And what I've tried to do then is um, to create a, a practical list of questions which the, the policy makers, the officials, could usefully bear in mind when they are devising frameworks. Right? So in a sense, to kind of create a, a template, a set of policy tools, the kinds of things that you need to be considering when you are devising a framework. Right? So, so that was the next step that I tried to contribute. The, the, the further step, right? Um, well, I, I think we're very much in accord here because this is where I think we should already be. Right? I mean, it seems to me that the first thing to do was to create the list, as the Secretary of State has explained, and then to classify, as the Secretary of State has suggested, and then when we've got to working then with a category where there is general agreement that we do need common frameworks, it seems to me that the immediate next step is to draft some, right, to sit down, right, do some discussions and actually sketch them out, right? And what I would like to have seen, and, and again, I'm frank about this, I think we should have already done this, right? We should already have some draft frameworks out there. Um, and um, this doesn't seem to me to be a, a, a sort of a, an impossible demand. I mean, I go back to the, the making of the Wales Act, where 2017, where we were, in a sense, changing, as I said, from a conferred powers model to the reserve powers model. And if you look at the original UK government white paper, Powers for a Purpose, what they did was that first they listed areas where they thought there would need to be reservations, and then they actually gave some worked practical examples of what that, you know, what a detailed reservation might look like. I believe it was on road traffic, and it was it was very carefully done, right? And you know, I think that's where we should be. And I, I say that for a number of reasons. First, because. Um, it, it, again, it seems to me it would help to take the constitutional heat out of the situation, which I would regard as valuable. <coughs> Second, from a parliamentary perspective, right, it seems to me that, that, that this parliament and Westminster and the National Assembly, and of course the Northern Ireland Assembly if it was sitting, right, you know, by now should have these, you know, some of these drafts to be looking at, to be grounding the discussion. Right? And certainly if I was, you know, if I may be so bold, if I, if I was contributing to the report of this committee, which I understand is going, you know, the first report anyway is going to be published before Christmas, I mean, I would be very much pushing for that. Um, I would be saying, well, really, you know, if, we, if we're going to have a discussion around the EU withdrawal bill and all these common frameworks, well, we'd like to see what some of them look like, right? That's our job as parliamentarians to scrutinise. And then... Um, at another level again, and I think you will agree immediately how important this is, um, stakeholders. Right? We're talking here about common frameworks. We're, we're, we're talking, in, naturally, we focus on the relationships between governments, the relationships between parliament. But ultimately, these common frameworks will have end users. I mean, you know, businesses, uh, consumer groups voluntary sector, I mean, citizens, right, will all be operating on the basis of these common frameworks. And it seems to me that the sooner that we have drafts out there, the sooner that we can have real participation and consultation from all the people who are likely to be affected. That's, that's part of the democratic process. Um, and, and, and so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm disappointed, right, about how f I think we're behind the curve where we need to be. And so, you know, I would be really pushing to speed that up. And where I, I disagreed again with the, with, with the Secretary of State was that last time, I think he had a threefold classification. The list, the, um, the idea of fixing the process, and then he said to the committee last week, ah, oh, but we won't have time to be dealing with any content. 
ahead of the European withdrawal bill. Now, I would really want to put that into question. I'm not, you know, and I um, and, 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 and what Kirsty Hughes has said is, is clearly right. You won't be able to know everything because, you know, it partly depends on, on what we end up with. But there are some things... Right. So we ought to be able to get some of the substance out there, and we should certainly be able to get some of the substance out in draft, for all the reasons that I that I've suggested. Okay. Alexander, you okay. thank, thank you very much. It's been Just, very, very helpful. I wonder, with all that, that's a lot of intergovernmental machinery going on there to get all that done. There's a lot of discussion, etc. What's the role for Parliament in all this? This Parliament, in terms of scrutinising that. Or what should the role be? Is that to me? To me? Whoever. whoever. I, just, I just throw that in there as a thought mm, well, before it, I yeah. move on. Clearly there is a role for Parliament in scrutinising this. Um, not for just, just for one Parliament, for more than one Parliament, which raises the question of cooperation between them. Uh, are you going to do this separately, independently of one another, or are you going to take into account what's being done elsewhere? And if so, how are you going to do it? And this is something I've talked about to the, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, where I think it was Monica Lennon asked the very reasonable question, how are we with a very small number of MSPs on this committee, how are we going to scrutinise um, all of this work? Um, to which my answer, or part of my answer, was does this not make the case for interparliamentary cooperation? Um, and I was given to understand by uh, one, one of the clerks that there are discussions ongoing, and I think the deputy convener may have been participated in some of those discussions about that. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, I think it's essential that we that the issue of parliamentary scrutiny is faced up to, uh, recognising uh, the constraints in terms of resources, time uh, uh, that apply to each each parliament, and therefore proceeds on the basis of a cooperative rela um, relationship between them. Just to help for the record purposes, there is already formed an interparliamentary forum, mm -hmm. which is beginning that is which is the embryonic part, I think, of a process that might well grow up in. Yeah. Both the deputy convener and myself have been involved in these discussions. Mm. Can, can I support what, what Professor Page has said most strongly there? And, and just to make this point to, to, to the committee, and again, um, you, you, you'll see where I'm coming from, given what I said about when you compare the, the Welsh and the Scottish lists. Um, we're talking here about common frameworks. When we talk about common frameworks, that, that immediately gets you into multilateral arrangements around the United Kingdom. That, to me, suggests that we need good and effective multilateral forms of intergovernmental relations, but also good and effective multilateral forms of parliamentary relations. Right? It seems to me that, one, that, that, that it must be sensible when one is scrutinising a common framework from the perspective of Scotland to have an appreciation of how this common framework is going to look like from Northern Ireland, Wales and England, right? if it's a common framework that we're all going to share. Right, that seems to me to be the logic of the situation. Just you want to add in before? Just, know. just very briefly. I mean, I, I just think that there's on on top of all all that, there's there's a broader, you know, bandwidth problem in in terms of the amount of scrutiny that's needed. There, there will, as well as common frameworks, there's going to be new regulatory frameworks at UK level that used to be at. EU level and and that are going to have profound consequences across the UK and obviously that's a lot of that will be then for for Westminster parliamentary scrutiny um, but but in terms of both civil service time and in terms of, of political time and other forms of accountability I, I think you know Brexit poses an, an extraordinary problem and, and that's not the only reason for, for some of the, the certain uh, inconsistencies through to chaos that, w that we're seeing but it's uh, certainly one of them if you're trying to re-engineer your whole system in an extraordinary hurry. Alexander, do you have any more questions? Thank you very much. Ivan? Uh, thanks, thanks uh, <coughs> panel, for coming to talk to us this morning. The area I wanted to go into in a wee bit more detail was round about the um, interplay between trade negotiations and the common frameworks. 
Um, now, to some extent, we've, we've kind of talked, and, and, and Dr Hughes has talked about the timing, which sounds very variable. We don't know what common frameworks are, are going to be. We don't know when they're going to be in place. They need to be in place before March 19, or can they be developed through the transition period? Obviously, that, that's unclear, and also depending on the relationship with the EU, um, whether it's soft, hard, or something in between, that will determine what th those common frameworks look like. But I suppose it's, it's taken it beyond that. Um, what we're kind of you can imagine a common framework as being something static. We'll kind of figure out what it is and then we'll, we'll implement it and that'll be it. But of course, the reality is we're going to be having negotiations with the, the EU27 on that relationship, trade relationship, but also with every other country in the world. Um, and every time we do a deal with Australia, Canada, Japan, whatever, there are going to be non-tariff barriers and there are regulatory issues in there that are going to impact potentially across all the common frameworks that are in place. So I suppose it's how the, the dynamic aspect of that is going to be managed on top of everything else we've talked about, um, because clearly the UK government, when it's negotiating, will want to be able to say our non-tariff regulations on whatever are X, therefore Japan, we can do a deal with you, but if, if part of that is tied up in the common framework and the devolved uh, administrations have got some say in that, how do you see all that? kind of coming together and how do the devolved administrations have an input into those negotiations as well? I think I addressed that point, point in my paper and, uh, where I, I took and what, another point that I've been keen to stress from, from the outset that this is, this is a much broader issue than simply those, a question of those EU competences that uh, are devolved and on one view at least ought to fall to the Scottish Parliament. There is this much bigger question of all the other competences uh, which will or have implications uh, for Scotland, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. And foremost among these is, is the one that you highlighted, the negotiation and conclusion of trade agreements, you say rightly, with the, with the EU and also with all non-EU countries. And what that highlights for me, as I say in my paper, is, is the need for a much more thoroughgoing system of intergovernmental relations which encompasses that and ensures that the interests of the devolved um, nations are properly taken into account in the exercise of um, it, it, in the negotiation and conclusion of those agreements. And the, and the truth is that we've got very limited and the experience we actually, we actually have of that is actually, in Scotland's case, quite bad. You know, Scotland just simply forgotten about um, when Tony Blair did his deal with um, Gaddafi uh, and forgot about the prisoner transfer agreement. Prisons <laughs> is a devolved responsibility, uh, or the criminal justice system is a devolved responsibility. So um, we need to pick up and begin to address that whole new dimension of, of intergovernmental relations. The words are there on paper, as I think I indicated in my submission, but there's, there's no machinery, um, effective working to back it up. And I can well imagine that there are interests in ensuring that there is no such machinery. The UK government would prefer to get on with this, undisturbed or unfettered by, by the claims of the devolved administrations, which is why I think these need to be highlighted and highlighted now. Anybody else want to, um, Kirsty? Yes, I mean, I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's a very good and important question, and the question itself sh shows, you know, how, 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 how difficult and, and big that this is. And, of course, if you think about the EU negotiating trade deals, the reason, um, in the case of Canada, it ended up in the w Walloon Parliament was because these are uh, quite often mixed agreements and then they have to conform with, with constitutional arrangements of, of the member states as well. Um, and, and so, as Alan says, cer certainly, you know, are you just going to have something that says, well, OK, the, the UK government just decides or, or Westminster just decides, or actually, no, once we've set up these new structures and, and non-tariff barriers and regulatory structures, as you say, a, a structured across... Um, across the, the devolved administrations um, and parliaments as, as well, then, then I, well, I, you know, I think you have a very big problem. So, for, for instance, um, we talk about a transition, but potentially a very short transition. Um, 
But the EU27 cannot speak for, for the third countries, the 60-odd third countries that it has trade deals with, obviously. And as, as you know, in the, in the published trade bill, the, government, the UK government is again just trying to say, well, actually, we don't need to bring all this to, to Parliament, just give us the powers to, that we'll, we'll go off and negotiate these on our own. I, th I think that's going to be difficult in some cases. It, it will be time-consuming. Uh, the Financial Times, I can't remember the exact number, but I think they estimated that apart from those crucial trade agreements, there are about s over 700 <coughs> excuse me, international arrangements and, and treaties that also might need renegotiating or, or replacing um, in some sense. So, so I think both for the transition from where we are um, to, to any future deal, these issues are, are going to come up straight away. And that's why the, this, this question, um, even, even if it's going into other committees' areas, but this question of how do you prolong the customs union? Um, in what way could you do that, even, even for, say, say two, two years, needs, needs some answer. And would that be enough to at least for two years prolong the, the, those agreements with those 60 other countries? Because otherwise you're going to get into that ex extremely quickly. Uh, and just one other comment on, on the time horizons here. As I understand it, the view in Brussels is that you, you cannot have a long transition um, and the reason you can't have a long transition is you would start to get legal challenges to agreeing that under Article 50. Um, and, and that really, if you're going to have a four or five year transition, <coughs> excuse me, that starts to look almost like a, a quasi trade deal. And in that case, it should be agreed under, under Article 218 and other articles of, of, of the treaty. Um, so, so it's not necessarily in the EU's gift, even if they were open to it, to have a long transition period. What, there's another wrinkle to that, which is could you make it part of the Article 50 agreement that there's a possibility to extend it? So you set it up as short, but you extend it. And, and the significance of this is obviously both whether you can decide this by majority in the European Council or by unanimity, and also whether it has to even go back to member states, parliaments, and, and, and so forth. So, so I think this question of, you know, how does the split of non-tariff barriers but between UK level and devolved level feed into trade negotiations is, is extremely important, very difficult to resolve, and not one just for the long term. It's one that needs to be resolved as we head, perhaps, towards, uh, towards a transition phase. And Professor Ollard, as you're answering this question as well, can I just draw you to something you said in your, in your own paper? Because you, you, you suggested a, a, bit, a potential new machinery to start to deal with some of this around a a GMC domestic single market, um, and uh, and that was you know, it's a it's first time I've seen that suggestion, and obviously that would have a an interplay with trade deals as well, um, but it still leaves in my mind well that architecture might be there. It still leaves in my mind if there's a dispute, how do we resolve it, and does that still just come back to the UK government Parliament being sovereign at the end of the day, and they make the decision? Because that seems to me to be the nub of this for as far as Scotland's concerned. Surely. Um, thank you, convener. I, um, so let's let's then. I, I think I, I, I suggested two bits of machinery um, in in that paper. Um, the first one, I, I, just a sentence. I mentioned the idea of a, a joint ministerial committee on international trade, um, and I didn't develop that because actually that's been suggested by the Institute for Government. Um, so I left that there. Um, the, the, the one that I suggested was the idea of um, uh, a, a, a joint ministerial committee for uh, a domestic single market, as you say, and it picks up on the, the, the first part of the question, I think, that it's all very well establishing the common, you know, some common frameworks, but these common frameworks will be living instruments. Um, regulatory challenges change, um, there is technological innovation, etc., etc. So it seems to me that um, I wanted to put a marker down that, yes, it's all very well having a revivified JMC European negotiations, but at some point the European negotiations will stop. Right? And I wanted to suggest that, that, that you know, we would need ongoing machinery in that area. If we are going to have elements of shared governance here, if we are 
um, uh, you know, it will be a continuing process of negotiation and fine tuning. And so I thought it was very important to, uh, to, to introduce the idea of having some form of standing machinery to achieve that. Right, so that's where I was coming for that because it seems to me that, that, that you know, I mean, okay, we can, we can do some common agreements, but, you know, things, things happen. We have, to, we have to have machinery in place to deal with that. We then come to the vexed question, right, of, 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 of how we resolve disputes, right? And um, naturally, um, with my Welsh perspective, I'm very aware that there is a very developed set of proposals from the Welsh government in its paper um, titled Brexit and Devolution, where it goes into very great detail um, about voting rules, um, uh, um, on, 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 on how you would decide disputes. I mean, I, my own view is that attractive though that is, that just has no political traction in Whitehall and Westminster, that that is just too much of a jump for the UK government to accept. Um, and um, so my, my proposal was somewhat more modest, frankly, um, because I just don't think that the UK government will take that kind of approach. Yeah, but okay. But how how do then, if there's a dispute, do we resolve it? Well, ultimately, this has to be done to the greatest extent possible through consensus and agreement. Um, but yes, I mean, ultimately, I'm driven back to the fact that you know it is a union. Right, um, you know, at least for the time being, and that ultimately the UK Parliament would have to take a view. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, oh, thanks. Sorry, uh, apologies. Uh, I, I was tempted just to, to throw in. Um, we talked earlier about Section 58, and clearly it talks about the UK government's rights with regard to the devolved administrations with regard to international deals, but it doesn't say it's existing international deals or new international deals. So is there a, a, a scenario whereby the UK government wants to do a deal with somebody um, and it has to play the Section 58 card in order to railroad that through? Well, <laughs> no, it's, it's talking about existing international obligations, okay. Section 58. Okay. But, but, just, but just to follow up on, on, on your... Um, what Professor Rowling said, I mean, I said earlier all of this points to the need for a more thoroughgoing system of intergovernmental relations. What I didn't add, uh, but what I have in mind is that that will have to extend in certain cases to joint decision making. That That is the nettle, you know, which has to be grasped. Um, and you're not going to grasp it as a general principle for exactly the reason that uh, Professor Rawlings has indicated that uh, the UK government, I don't think, would wear that as a general proposition. But when you get to the nitty gritty of working out what these common frameworks are, I think you know there will be questions of different levels of importance to um, the devolved administrations, and some should certainly be you know, we're not going to do this or we're not going to change it other than on the basis of agreement. So I, I, so I would be looking to preempt the possibility of disputes arising by having, in relation to certain key issues, provision for joint decision making. That's, that's the position I expressed in, 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 in my paper. Sorry, Patrick. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning. The, I, I want to start with a, a follow-on question from Ivan's uh, line of, of questioning about trade agreements. Um, I think, uh, Dr Hughes, your paper s suggests very clearly that you anticipate uh, something like the, uh, the trade agreement with Canada, um, whether it's exactly like that or, or something else that the UK government has in mind that hasn't told anyone about yet, we don't know. But we know that these things can be very controversial, as you, as you indicated earlier, particularly in issues like uh, investor state dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, generally, there's an argument that those kind of mechanisms transfer what should be democratically accountable power for governments to regulate and legislate toward unaccountable bodies uh, like uh, tribunals within the EU. That's not such a problem because there is a level of European democracy to which those decisions are accountable. Um, if we go, if the UK goes in this direction in some way, there's going to have to be something like an investor state dispute mechanism 
is it possible for such a mechanism to respect the devolved competences of governments within the UK in relation to their legislative areas, the, the jurisdiction of Scottish courts and tribunals, uh, and how much influence would the devolved authorities have over those kind of mechanisms and the decisions they can make? How, how can we hold those democratically accountable? My brief answer, <laughs> while you're thinking about it, <laughs> is all issues to be addressed. <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't pretend to sit here and have an answer to mm. it, but yes, the issues you highlight are of the first importance and ought not to be lost sight of in all of this. Yeah, I think it's. I, I think it's a huge. You know, it's it's a huge question. Uh, absolutely, you're right. The, these investor state dispute settlement mechanisms have come under a, a huge amount of attention, scrutiny and criticism um, recently, quite rightly. In my view, the, Ca the Canada one was tweaked to take account of that to some degree. Um, TTIP has obviously sort of gone onto the back burner or, or into the dustbin, depending on your view. Um, but it, it, it was cl clearly um, going to remain very sensitive there. And, uh, and on the other hand, if you were in a, a Norway-type situation, then, then you'd have have the EFTA court, um, and probably my colleagues are better qualified than me to talk about uh, how, how devolved courts and legislation w relate to the to the EFTA court, which I think is, is a rather important and interesting question. Um, just, um, it, it's slightly to one side of your question, but just, just to add it in while, while we're on the issue, I, I think, yes, we don't know what um, the Prime Minister means by, by deep and special, um, but not Canada and not Norway, but we can clearly guess that she very much hopes um, that, that there will be a trade deal that will give much more access to services than the, the Canada or, or South Korea ones do. Um, that looks highly, highly unlikely if you talk to people in the EU 27 or, um, or in Brussels. Um, and there, there's both, and, and that, that obviously has very serious implications for, for Scottish exports. The so National Institute of Economic and Social Research has talked about a, a greater than 60% fall in services trade in the case of a Canada-style trade agreement. Um, and, and the latest line out of Brussels is not only just that they won't, won't give the UK that, they're starting to say they can't give it that because of MFN, most favoured nation clauses in the Canada and South Korea deals that would mean if they did give it us, they'd have to offer it to those other, other countries as well. So that, obviously that's a bit to one side of the dispute settlement issue, but it's very important for these wider, wider issues. No, no, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the regularity with which I've heard the phrase deep and special relationship suggests to me that it, it it just means please don't hate us for doing this. Uh, it doesn't seem to have, have uh, developed any more meaning than that so far. I'm, I'm interested though to know whether any of the witnesses are aware of similar trade agreements to, to the range of possibilities that might exist which do, either in relation to Canada uh, or other countries, which do recognise the ability of different levels of jurisdiction within a country. Uh, in Scotland, in relation to legislative authority, courts and tribunals, which are separate in Scotland, are there any pre-existing examples of trade agreements in which a country has managed to achieve that level of recognition of authority and, and democratic accountability being uh, exercised at different levels? I, I, I don't know, but you can ask your question and you should ask your question of the position of the devolved administrations in relation to the EU and the EU, EU's rules on standing, uh, who can bring actions before the European Court of Justice. Uh, and I'm having to dig deep into the recesses of my memory at this point, and I may not be entirely reliable, but I think it is the case that it is only the UK government and not the devolved administrations that can litigate before the European Court of Justice. So if Scotland, for example, had an issue with something that was being done by the EU, EU or by analogy uh, under some as yet to be concluded international trade agreement, the question would be, could Scotland of its own motion pursue that concern, concern issue through whatever dispute settlement mechanism has been established, or is it 
in the hands of the UK government when it comes to that. And that principle was not conceded. I think I'm right in saying, and I, yeah. I'm conscious that you're in, yeah. Professor Rawlings is nodding his head in relation to the EU. And therefore, going back to what we were saying about all issues to be addressed, yeah. that is a no, critical I, one. I appreciate that point. The difference is, of course, the EU does have a level of democratic accountability. Scotland has parliamentarians elected to represent us in the European Parliament. Well, it, it is at least an attempt. <laughs> well, I mean, well, th firstly, I would set a lot of store by by the powers of the European Parliament. Um, so, but I think I mean, I, I mean, there's there's obviously multiple levels to to your question. But as I already referred to, we we saw in the EU Canada trade deal, the the Walloon Parliament hold that up. So certainly at, at that level of at the stage of actually agreeing the thing, um, different constitutional agreement arrangements in the EU member states have have come into play, so I, I can't see why that couldn't also operate for the UK if, if we chose to set it up in that way. How, how it then operates subsequent to that um, in terms of powers of the Walloon Parliament in, in any disputes, I, uh, that I don't know. Well, I I'm thought, thought to be being, being unduly dismissive of the Scottish Parliament, uh, the, the EU Parliament. The point I was making is that we've got six MEPs in a parliament of, I think it's 751 MEPs. Sure. I mean, I mean, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, point, the, the point that I was, well, two points really. I mean, I think that the direction of the, the, the last two questions, if I may say so, is spot on, because it seems to me that the whole area of international trade and the relationship between international trade and devolution, this is going to be, you know, a, a controversy which is going to run and run and run. And, you know, if I may say so, I think you're, you're, you're both absolutely right to focus on this aspect. Um, the second point I wanted to make was that um, I think there's a, a very considerable distance to travel on this. Um, and I would, um, I don't know if committee members have had a chance to um, look at the new Board of Trade, which uh, established by the UK government in the last month or so, and the briefing documents around that. And what you'll find is that that is a very top-down approach, uh, where the devolved administrations, um, far from being represented on the new UK Board of Trade, um, are treated very much as stakeholders, um, along with lots of other stakeholders, right? And, and so it seems to me that, that that's actually sort of quite a negative set of messages which the UK government is sending out there that, you know, personally, I'm, I, I'm sort of very disappointed in. Um, I also wanted to ask uh, about uh, Dr. Hughes' paper in relation to... I'll come back to that one. Okay, I'll store that for a moment. Thank you. So, we've obviously been dealing with the issue of international trade um, to more mundane matters, but nevertheless important, and around ministerial powers. I just need to get some of that stuff on the record. I know that Emma wanted to ask some questions around that. Okay. So. Thanks, Convener. Good morning, everybody. In your paper, um, Professor Page, you talked about the ministers will gain far-reaching powers in, to legislate in the devolved areas and powers that are said to be justified by the scale of the challenges represented by Brexit and the shortness of time which we have to negotiate. So I'm interested in the, you know, the fact that you stated that this is a radical departure from the principles of which the devolution statement is based. Can you expand on that a wee bit, please? Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, this is something which... Um, I looked at his scans when I first saw it, uh, and, I, and in particular I looked at his scans at the proposition that not only should UK ministers have the freedom to legislate in the exercise of the powers to be conferred by clauses 7 to 9 across devolved as well as reserved areas, but that they should have this power subject only to a non-binding um, requirement of consultation with the Scottish ministers. No provision, no requirement for their consent, no provision for Scottish parliamentary um, scrutiny or approval of the, of the regulations resulting from the exercise of those powers. And I think what may have been lost sight of, or not sufficiently picked up, which is why I stress it in my submission, is, as you pointed out, how radical a departure this is uh, from the existing devolution settlement, where 
in contrast to the power of the Westminster Parliament, which, as you know, remains sovereign, can legislate for Scotland. Uh, the Act specifically states that. There is no equivalent provision in relation to the power of um, uh, UK ministers uh, when it comes to the making of subordinate legislation. They have only very limited powers, and the most significant one is, is that Section 57.1 power, the power to implement um, EU law obligations in the devolved areas. But as a general rule, they have no such power. Um, the power belongs to the Scottish ministers, and that is for the perfectly understandable and correct reason because they are responsible in those areas. So what we, so what we are proposing to do uh, without, um, as I say, the degree of, well, I mean, the question has been picked up, but it certainly deserves merits highlighting, uh, is how radical a departure this is from the, the principles on which um, um, the lawmaking system or the law lawmaking system is based. And we're giving um, UK ministers I used to say to my students uh, that uh, EU membership, the European Communities Act, began with two blank checks, one blank check in favour of the EU institutions to write laws, another blank check uh, in favour of um, UK ministers to implement uh, EU obligations. Uh, I'm tempted to say it will end with one blank check, and that blank check being in favour of UK ministers to legislate, as I say, across um, uh, devolved as well as reserved areas. I think that's simply unacceptable. Uh, I did, um, as Professor Rawlings did, possibly not as closely, but I did look at what the Secretary of State said in evidence to this committee, and I, there were a lot of warm words there, but I didn't get any sense of actual movement on, yes, we will concede the principle of Scottish ministerial consent to the exercise of these powers. I think that's absolutely fundamental. So and that principle needs to be conceded. Right, so the options then for proceeding that you've alluded to in your paper, um, could you explain a wee bit m more about that? So, we need Scottish ministerial consent as a, as a precondition of either the exercise of powers by UK ministers in the devolved areas or if um, Scottish ministerial consent uh, is withheld the exercise of those powers or the section clause 10 analogous powers by, by by the Scottish ministers. I think I think that's the first step. Now, I didn't go into this in my paper, but I think for practical reasons, reasons of resources, as much as anything, the temptation will be to go with what the UK proposes. We will be seeing a lot of UK or GB wide legislation in the devolved areas when it comes to uh, making sure that the statute book will function properly after we have left the EU. Um, there have been statements, um, so this was the first of my three options, um, UK ministers, uh, Scottish ministers grant consent. There have been another set of warm words, assurances from um, Scottish ministers, one minister in particular, that yes, the parliament will be informed about all of this. And uh, my point, which I made indirectly, I didn't uh, spell it out, is that these assurances tend to be easily, easily given and equally easily forgotten about. Um, and I did uh, do some work on the transposition of EU obligations and the circumstances in which the Scottish government had relied on UK legislation and the transposition of these obligations. Um, the Scottish Government was remarkably coy about this. Didn't say, couldn't say. I went to Brussels and I spoke to people there in a separate connection. Spoke to the Scottish office, Scottish Government representatives. Oh yes, we do it all the time. <laughs> the only people that didn't know about it was this Parliament. Uh, notwithstanding a commitment made by several administrations of different political complexions that the parliament would be kept informed. It was, a, it was a commitment which was just forgotten about, a lot, allowed to go by the by. And I did raise it with the uh, Europe and External Relations Committee, after which I think it was picked up again. Uh, but for whatever reason, it was forgotten about. So if it is the case, as I suspect, that we're going to be relying heavily on UK subordinate legislation to tidy up the... Um, statute book to make sure it operates from properly, uh, 
then this Parliament needs to know about it and needs to be certain <laughs> that it is being told about it and it's not just being allowed to go by the by. Um, so that would be that would be my first step, uh, and then you go into this question of well scrutiny of these UK, let's say UK or GB made regulations. Uh, what provision is there for input by this Parliament into that scrutiny, which takes us back to our question of interparliamentary cooperation? Are we just going to leave it to the UK Parliament to scrutinise this as best they can, or is there going to be provision for this Parliament to A, know about it and voice any concerns that it might have about what's being done? And then the last of my three possibilities is where the Scottish ministers make the changes and then it's the job of the delegated powers and law reform committee to, to pick up the question of, of scrutiny. So that, that was, sorry I've gone on a, a bit at length, but that, that was what I had in mind. On the record, yeah. I'm glad you have. Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to just make a comment on, on that? Sure. I mean, similar concerns as you would expect have been expressed in Wales. Can I, I, I just place on the record a, a particular set of points um, I'm sure the, the committee has already um, considered them, but, but I do think it's, it's, it's worth putting them on the record again. Um, and this is what I call constitutional protection um, of the devolution statutes. Um, if we look at uh, clauses 7, 8 and 9, these are the ministerial powers to deal, UK ministerial powers to deal with deficiencies compliance with international obligations and implementing the withdrawal agreement. Now, at the moment, um, those powers could be used to change the devolution statutes. Um, in a way, if you like, it's a, it's a sidestep of the civil convention. Right, um, because you don't uh, you don't require legislative consent here because you know that civil convention isn't isn't um, engaged. Now, um, can I draw the committee's attention to um, clause seven six, where uh, amending and repealing the Northern Ireland Act is specifically exempt from that power to correct deficiencies, and rightly so in my opinion. And that is explained um, in the explanatory notes on the basis that the 1998 Act uh, reflects the Belfast Agreement and so that there are concerns obviously about the peace process and international obligations in play. And as I say, that, that, that's an excellent set of, of, of explanations. What it doesn't explain is why constitutional protection of that kind can't also be extended to the Scot Scottish settlement and to the Welsh settlement. And it seems to me that they, it should be. Likewise with Clause 8, um, again, it seems to me that the devolution settlements, the, the, the devolution statutes should be specifically exempted from that power um, 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 uh, to make regulations complying with international obligations. If you want to do that, um, it seems to me that um, uh, you, 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 you have to do that through legislation. Um, and again, with um, Clause 9, um, there is no protection for um, any of the three devolution settlements. Indeed, there isn't any protection for any of the devolution settlements under, under Clause 8. So I think there's, I think there's, a, the, the, there's quite a big uh, set of issues there which the committee, um, I would invite the committee to address. And of course, they've been covered um, by the, um, the joint amendments. We now seem to have a new alliance between the Scottish government and the Welsh government for these purposes. Um, and the amendments proposed by those two governments um, specifically deal um, with that matter. Um, and it seems to me that the, the Scottish and the Welsh governments are, are entirely right in, in, in bringing forward that set of amendments um, to protect the devolution statutes. Thank you. Um, we've got to slightly wider issues now. I'm going to take Neil in, in first, if you don't mind, Patrick. I'll come back to you. I just wanted to get your thoughts um, uh, on Article 50. And uh, Lord Kerr, who drafted Article 50 of the European Union Treaty, stated on Friday that Article 50 need not be implemented as the letter from the UK government uh, only declares a notification of intention to withdraw from the European Union. just wanted to get your brief thoughts on that. And, and do you agree with Lord Kerr? I, I, I do agree, uh, without elaborating on it. 
I was asked to write a piece for the conversation, and <laughs> I declined because just so many things going on at the moment. But uh, yes, I think it, it is a notice of an intention to withdraw, um, and uh, subject to. And I think the point that is usually made is that ultimately what Article 50 means is a matter for the European Court of Justice. But you know, I would assume that uh, you can uh, withdraw notification, notwithstanding you might, how shall I put it, hack a lot of people off if, having put them through all of this, you were then to turn around and say, actually, we've changed our mind. Um. Yes, I mean, I think I think the the question is, is I mean, you, can you halt Brexit? Yes, I think you can, but it's obviously a, a legal and a political question. Um, and as Alan Page has just just said, there you, potentially that could, as a legal question, if it was contested, end up at the European Court of Justice. Um, that there are disagreements as to whether you can unilaterally withdraw notification. Um, the European Parliament, obviously, in its April resolution, uh, said, said it, it should need agreement of the member states and, and the Parliament itself to do that. Um, the, the European Commission has said something similar. It said it um, in not that much noted, I think, press release on, on the day of the Article 50 notification. Um, there is a huge breakdown of trust between the UK and the EU 27. Um, and that damage to that relationship is, is getting worse almost on a, on a daily basis. Um, I find it very difficult at a political level to envisage the UK withdrawing that notification, staying in whatever was happening here in terms of would you have to have a second EU referendum or would you not. Um, it's very hard to imagine the UK saying it's staying in, in the teeth of political statements of opposition from the other EU27. You'd have to see it as some great getting over this extraordinary hiatus, a great healing of political wounds and of us, us being welcomed back. If, if the UK was still actually immensely divided in economic crisis, in political crisis, had, uh, where, you know, where do we get to this withdrawal of a notification? Has, has the government collapsed? Has there been an emergency general election? If we get a sort of second EU referendum where there's a 50.5% vote to remain, I think the, e the EU27 are going to be wary, and I think there's too much of a presumption that we will we will simply be welcomed back with open arms. Now, now, as you know, so, some EU politicians have talked about well, if the EU, if the UK does come back, um, we want to renegotiate the rebate. Um, that doesn't that doesn't follow. Certainly, it doesn't follow legally. If we withdraw before March 2019, we still have a veto on budget issues. But it just tells you something about about the political mood and, and about where next. So, so I think, into, I think um, I broadly agree with with John Kerr. But the question is is, is both a legal one and, and not just a matter, obviously, of legal opinion. And that's why it may may eventually need to go um, to the ECJ. But it, it, it's primarily on top of that. It's a political one. Patrick. Thank you, yes. Um, uh, sticking with, with Dr. Hughes, because again, it's picking up on something from, from your um, written submission. Um, you make it very clear that the bill, as it stands, is clearly predicated on the assumption that the UK will be leaving the single market and the, and the customs union, uh, that so-called, inverted commas, hard Brexit approach, um, and that in a, a parallel universe somewhere in which a different position was being taken and a UK government wanted to stay in uh, the, the single market, uh, much simpler legislation would be required. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be anything like the bill that we're looking at at the moment. Am I right in, in reading your paper that you seem to be going further and saying that if, if this bill passes, a change of, of position by the UK government to stay in the single market would then be very problematic? Would it be possible? Um, I think, I mean, I, I think in, in terms of what you've, you first said, yes, my view is certainly that it, it, it could be much simpler 
you know, there's, there's that, that, that old uh, phrase beloved of economists about uh, is, is something both necessary and sufficient. Um, so if you were going down a sort of Norway European economic area route, a, a lot of this might not be necessary. Um, but your, your crunch question is, um, would it nonetheless be sufficient to, to, uh, to allow that? Um, I actually asked uh, my neighbor here, Professor Alan Page, this, this question two weeks ago and, and put his quote um, in, into, into the comment piece I wrote and referenced it in my, in my written evidence. So I certainly defer to, to him on that as to, to, to whether some of these concepts of retained EU law would, would be the same in that case. I mean, you obviously had Keir Starmer raised that in Westminster a couple of days ago <coughs> um, in, in terms of it, uh, the withdrawal bill, in his view, not, not being appropriate for a transition that involved the extension of the EU Saki because of the ECJ. But obviously, in, in the EFTA case, that is anyway slightly different. I mean, just to, to, to suggest a scenario, you know, the, the bill trundles on in the, in the new year. A few concessions are made to the, the devolved governments sufficient to win legislative consent. Uh, bad news starts leaking out of the, the negotiations. Uh, a series of companies start to say, we'll move out, we won't invest, jobs are being lost. Three or four MPs are forced to resign on grounds of sexual harassment and thumping great uh, majorities are won in those constituencies for explicitly pro-single market or anti-Brexit uh, candidates. Uh, and another dozen Tory backbenchers join the rebels and start saying uh, we should stay in the single market. In, in those kind of circumstances, you could have a clear unity between a House of Commons vote, a House of Lords vote, a Welsh Assembly vote and a Scottish Parliament vote saying Britain should apply to join the EEA. If, if that was the case, and this bill has been passed, do we then have an equally massive job of correcting a set of legislative mistakes that have been made that aren't compatible with that new position? I, I think Alan probably is better placed to answer much of that than me. I, I would just say, I personally think the so-called soft Brexit, and I, I think the sort of scenario you're outlining could happen, is... It's very hard to see it as sustainable. How long is the UK going to stay potentially in the single market and, and the customs union without any say in those rules before there are trade deals made and regulatory rules made that we have no democratic say, <laughs> say over it at all? Um, so, but I think a dash to the EEA at some point is, depending how this unfolds, whether it's early next year or or perhaps if, if Westminster rejected the deal next autumn, if there is a deal, a dash to the EA might turn out to be uh, short of halting Brexit, maybe the two options you're, you're facing. And so your, your question on the withdrawal bill, yes, it's certainly pertinent. If only rational things were to happen, we'd be living a very different life at the moment. Well, you see, you've just given us your dream, and you're talking about <laughs> rational. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor does, Page. does Professor Page want to add anything about, really about how how realistic a change of policy would be, even if it was desired, even if it, it became possible. Uh, do we have huge problems in implementing a change of policy if it was to happen, uh, yeah. if this bill is passed? Yes. I think uh, pursuing your dream, you know, the bill might be passed but never brought into force, but leaving that to one side. Um, the point that I made in response to the question that I was asked by Kirsty was that in those circumstances, retained EU law would take on a different meaning. It would not be retained in the sense retained as used in the in the current bill. That is to say, a body of law whose retention, amendment, revision, repeal is a matter ultimately for the UK Parliament. It would be a body of law over which uh, EU institutions. Uh, the EU legal system would have a much greater degree of say than is envisaged under this bill. So it would become a new description of the status quo? It would become a new description of the, the status quo, but one which is fundamentally at odds with the idea of retained EU law as used in the... Yes, right. it, you would be reverting to the status quo. Yeah. The, the status quo as, as at the moment. Uh, and I think that would then involve rethinking the notion of retained EU law and the 
applicability or appropriateness of this particular piece of legislation? It would be back to the drawing board. I think it's, 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 it's right to assume that this bill was drafted, um, perhaps not physically drafted, but, 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 but sketched um, ahead of the UK general election. Um, because if one looks at the bill and one compares the bill with the, the second white paper that the UK government published, which was um, on what, what we would need to do by way of legislation, which, if you recall, um, had that very short chapter, uh, very short chapter, four paragraphs, in fact, on relationships with the devolved administrations. If you if you compare the bill what it, with what is said in the white paper, which I think was 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 published in in, in April or something like that, um, it the bill is very much what you would expect from 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 the from from the white paper. Um, but of course, we've had the UK general election in between, and shall we say that perhaps the political assumptions on what the House of Commons might look like um, have been um, somewhat altered. So I think that's the first point, the political point. Um, the second point I'd like to make is that um, something that really doesn't fit with the bill is the idea, in my view, is the idea of a transition arrangement. Because Clause 1... Um, talks about repeal of the 1972 Act. Well, once you have repeal of the 1972 Act, what is the basis for a transitional agreement of two years? Right? And so I'm not surprised to, to, to see it being ventured that if we were to go down the route of a transitional agreement, we would need fresh legislation. So, so again, and I, and, I think, and I think the two points fit together, because my sense is, I mean, certainly reading the, the legislating white paper, um, ahead of the UK general election, the idea of a transition arrangement wasn't featuring very highly in UK government thinking. Is Just to add, add one thing to that, my, my view was the same, but uh, there is oral evidence, I think, given by Sir Stephen Laws, who's former First Parliamentary Council, to evidence given by him to the European, exiting the European Union Committee of the House of Commons, where his answer to that question is that the, it is to be found in Clause 17. Um, so you could leave but make transitory, you could leave on the 29th of March, but nevertheless make transitory provisions which would accommodate this transitional or implementation agreement on, in the exercise of the powers of Clause 17. I haven't, tried, I haven't read that closely yet, but there is an answer out there. In my, in my, in my view, that, 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 that is an extraordinarily bold reading of Clause 17, which is essentially the clause which deals with a transitional... Uh, you know, transitional arrangements, consequential arrangements, the, the usual kind of clause that, that, that one sees in so many statutes. So I think, I mean, you know, obviously a, um, a figure of, of Sir Stephen Law's authority, um, you know, um, must, be, must be taken extremely seriously. But I have to say that is a very bold reading of Clause 17. Can I just add on that? I mean, the... the we have yet to see precisely what, what the EU27 guidelines will be on transition, but I think Michel Barnier and others have already been clear enough in the public domain uh, that they only see a transition that is a, a full extension of the acquis, and the European Parliament has repeated this, of course, as well, un, uh, under all the appropriate supervisory and judicial mechanisms. What, what I think, and so I'm not sure if, if that, you know, that, that I... I, I can't see how that would fit with the withdrawal bill, but it's also very interesting that the the the, the message in Brussels um, is that you, that they would expect that full extension of the acquis, but with the UK out of institutional decision-making structures. So they're not talking about an extension of membership. And so, so I don't know, and I have asked and uh, not yet got an answer in Brussels as how do they envisage that happening. So I don't think we know yet. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think you've helped us this morning flesh out some very important wider constitutional matters that go beyond the simple Clause 11. That was the purpose of today, so that's been very helpful in that regard. It's complex, complex that's for sure, but it's also fascinating. Um, uh, and I'd like to thank you very, very much for coming along and giving evidence to us today, and I now close this session of the committee. Thank you.